Hey. Whew. What's everyone doing? It's five o'clock. Not working, certainly, um, but hopefully joining us. Welcome. Welcome one and all. This is a first, and welcome to uh, Periscope audience and to YouTube audience as well. Um, it's Jonathan Honig, and we're here with Greg Salmieri, and with all of you, Greg is one of the contributors, one of many contributors to my new publication and the new publication, a new textbook of Americanism. Uh, this is a really exciting new project. I say it's 72 years in the making. It was actually started, if you'll indulge me, Greg, I'll yeah. give a quick bit, bit of background. And, and just as I say that, I want to take this opportunity, actually I should open up YouTube because we want to take your YouTube questions and Periscope questions as well. So um, as I'm just getting the chat up, we'll tell you quickly a little bit about the project. Uh, look at us, there we are. We're looking at ourselves on a video, isn't that crazy? Uh, very, very narcissistic about you. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that. Um, well, this book is, is, I say it's 72 years in the making, not because we've been writing it for, not because we've been writing it for 72 years, but because it, it actually started 72 years ago when Ayn Rand, who came to this country years before that as an immigrant, uh, was asked by a group that she was a part of called the Motion Picture Association for the Preservation of American Ideals. Uh, she was did not volunteer, as I understand it, Greg, to be part of this group. She was kind of co-opted as part of it. She didn't exactly run to be a member of it, but she was part of it and was commissioned. Please jump in, you know, uh, to correct me or, or to add anything if you'd like. But she was commissioned to write a series called Textbook, that was going to be called Textbook of Americanism, to be serialized in this group's yeah, publication. Yeah. I, you know, she was in a leadership position in the group, but I don't know how that came about it if she put herself forward or if they, people asked her to do it. I don't know exactly how, uh, how that came about, but she was, it was, it was a pretty significant yeah, group that. in the, the uh, film industry at the time. Yeah, this had uh, Walt, Walt Disney was involved, and uh, uh, I forget some of the other people. It's a really big people. Yeah, Clark Gable and uh, all the kind of the big heavyweights of the, of the era were part of this group, Motion Picture Association, and she was gonna write this series called textbook, as you can see it, textbook of Americanism. And this was going to be her, or this was her absolute layman's guide to her understanding of what this country was all about. And just to put it in a little bit of context here, you know, we're talking about the, the mid-1940s. Rand saw very clearly the, the, the growing trend of communism, not just in the culture, but specifically in Hollywood. And Greg, that's what textbook of Americanism kind of came about. This was a, you know, her understanding of Hollywood's influence, or I should say, communism's influence in the culture and on Hollywood in specific. Yeah, it's one of two publications from this time in the vigil. Um, the other is, or I don't know if it's a vigil, but from, from this group. The other is called The Screen Guide for Americans, where she's talking um, specifically to people in the movie industry about uh, how to notice communist propaganda, and uh, how to make sure, say if you're a studio head, but some of your writers maybe are communists or whatever, how to make sure there, there aren't things being smuggled into your pictures that you don't want there. And she was very, you know, this was a time when um, there was a lot of worry about communist conspiracy, but there also were a lot of communist conspiracies. Um, literal people who were taking orders from Moscow, and this has come out later after the fall of the USSR, people could do research in the archives, and you could find that there were people taking their direction uh, from the Soviets, but the, the Rand's approach to combating this was distinctive. Um, she wasn't interested in just, you know, rooting out who's a communist and finding communists uh, yes. there and, and, and disrupting the conspiracies that way. She thought the real issue was there were certain kinds of ideas that are um, counter to the American way of life, that are communist ideas, the kind of ideas that either come from communism or lead to it. And uh, these ideas are being spread sometimes intentionally by communists, but also uh, by a lot of people who uh, don't think of themselves as supporting communism, but do harbor ideas that are uh, that lead them. Can I? I'll jump in quickly. I mean, I, you know, Rand. Uh, 
I think, and, and I hear you saying, she understood it really as a problem of ideas and as an issue of ideas. She understood the country as being founded on specific ideas. And, and the public, and, and Greg, I think it's part of what makes the book so important now is, I think then, and certainly now, really uh, did not have a clear understanding of, of what really what Americanism is, what the, what the country is about and was based on. That was part of her impetus for wanting to write the original textbook 72 years ago. I think that's right. It, it's it true. The screen guide and the, the textbook is much more general. Uh, it's, it's, the screen guide is um, pointing out ways in which we're seeing propaganda in the film industry that, that, that go against the American way of life. But this is really then going back and trying to spell out what that is. What is the essential issue in the world today is how it starts. And what are the principles yeah. of the country? We'll, we'll, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll quickly run through kind of how the project came about, or I'll run through how the project came about. So um, as Greg mentioned this, so she, uh, she started writing, Iran started writing a textbook of Americanism, which was gonna be a series of 40 plus questions uh, to be published in The Vigil by this group, the Motion Picture Association. 11 of them were published. And at, the, uh, at, the, at that period, uh, at that time, she left the group. She severed her association with the Motion Picture Association, and the project was left unfinished. And for all these years, if you've ever looked it up or read it, it always says, to be continued, right? Dot, 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 to be continued. And Ayn Rand went on to become, <laughs> to say she was a, somewhat of an influential writer. I mean, she wrote this in 1946. It was nine years before uh, Atlas Shrugged had been uh, uh, published. So Ayn Rand's influence had barely even begun to be felt in the culture in 1946. This project, her project, was really abandoned. Uh, I uh, and was fortunate enough to be able to, uh, I don't want to say pick it up, but let me just start by saying being inspired by it. I read Ayn Rand's textbook of Americanism when I was first getting interested in, in objectivism, and I was one of those, those few who, Ayn Rand, I don't want to say she wouldn't have liked me, but you know, she always, uh, I think, was sounded like she was a little suspect of people who got into her nonfiction first, or more, in, more moved by her nonfiction. I have to say I was one of those people. Uh, I was very interested in politics as a young person, very certainly in, in economics. I was and continue to be a trader, and read her original textbook of Americanism, Greg, because I love the country. I was so passionate about the country, and I, I grew up in the 80s, but even beyond anything that was happening in politics, I, I, I won't bore you with my whole backstory, my whole origin stories, as they say, but I had just been always so committed to this country and really believed in this country. And when I discovered Textbook of Americanism, it, it floored me, because in, I don't know, 1,500 words, maybe 2,000 words, Iran lays out so eloquently, so powerfully, the basic fundamental principle principles, but certainly the principle on which the country was based, is based, uh, first and foremost, individualism. And she starts Textbook of Americanism way back when in 1946 saying, the basic issue in the world today is between two principles, individualism and collectivism. I love that, Greg, because you know, she doesn't start her treatise on politics uh, uh, or her thoughts on politics, I should say, was something like, well, what do you think about abortion? You know, what do you think about gun rights? And she starts so fundamentally, so basically. I discovered, uh, I'll quickly say, in, in, in the 90s, put it in the back of my head. I always knew that I wanted to do something with it. I always knew how powerful it was for me. And to make a long story short, subsequently and many years later, with the help of the Iron Institute, its scholars, its donors, had been fortunate to publish a new textbook of Americanism. Uh, which picks up uh, Ayn Rand's uh, work and, with the help of the Institute and scholars, uh, helps to put some context and uh, uh, help to answer some of the questions in our own perspective of how she might have answered them many years later. The book, so, so it, in effect, you never want to say completes because no one speaks for Ayn Rand but it presents Ayn Rand's original textbook and completes her unanswered questions with those scholars, I think, who certainly know her best. It also includes, you know her work best, I should say. It also includes unpublished, truly unpublished Ayn Rand, taken from her workshops on epistemology, held in New York in the 1970s, which she discusses a lot of truly fascinating issues about America and Americanism, about politics. You know, one of which, Greg, that I love which she talks about, let me talk about topical, she talks about 
quarantine. You know, and should you be required to get vaccines? We've got this whole anti-vax movement now, you know, people saying you're gonna either, I don't know if it's remember, you get autism from getting vaccines or don't get autism from like Some people think you get it from uh, getting the vaccine. Was it getting vaccines. So because there's the evidence for that. But. And at the same time, quarantine. So we have these things like, you know, Zika come up or, yeah. so should we have to quarantine? So Rand writes to that. So that's all in the book. It's a long way of saying, Greg is here, I'm here, the book is here, textbookofamericanism.com. And Greg, you're a big part of it, and thank you for being a part of it. Well, thanks for inviting me to be. It's uh, a real uh, thrill to be uh, you know, between the same covers uh, of the book with them. Well, yeah, and yeah. with some of the other contributors. Uh, yeah, yeah I and mean, I think, you know, I mean, we're going to take uh, questions on, on YouTube as well as Periscope if there, if there are questions. Um, but I just kind of go back to this idea of how important how vital, how relevant Rand's work was now, because you know, Greg, right now there's, to say that there's few voices, you know, when Rand's basic premise, I say, is that this country is founded on one thing, one, one thing more than anything else, and that is individualism. This country is founded on the idea of individualism. There's two basic ideas, ideals in the, in the world today, individualism and collectivism. If you want examples of collectivism, well, you can look to Soviet Russia, she gives us an example in the book, but you can look to even communist North Korea or, or socialist North Korea today or socialist Venezuela as examples of modern day collectivism. If you wanna look at ideas of individualism, in its best sense, look to America. You know, look to this country where, you know, you wake up every day, Greg, and you know, it's like, so let's take this out of the, the high towers of philosophy. What makes America truly great, truly great, is that right here, you, you own your life. That's pretty radical, isn't it? Yeah, and it's it's radical in a way that um, happily has caught on in a lot of the rest of the world by degrees. First in Europe, but I think you know America was the first country founded on these kind of principles. But um, you know, England, France, they got better, I think, as part of our influence, and a lot of Asia has, and India and now Africa even is too. So it's a radical idea that in some sense has sparked and caught on around the globe. And in another sense, it's radicalism though hasn't really been appreciated here uh, or in these other countries. That is some elements of it we're finding in more and more places and people are living better and better because they're freer uh, than they were in years past. You know, in China, say, where there's more freedom, a little less now than a few years ago, uh, but more than there were when I was a kid. Um, and uh, and India and so forth. But um, we're also seeing people don't understand what it is that um, makes America free, that makes America great, that's good about it. People in America who think of themselves as patriotic don't. People don't even know what the country, country is. Don't. Yeah, and so I think. I always feel too that I'm, I'm really, they feel like they, people have a, they have somewhere deep down, even young people, even millennials who've been spoon fed altruism, sacrifice, anti Americanism explicitly for. They have somewhere down there what Ayn Rand called the American sense of life. Individualism somewhere is down there that think that belief that that understanding that they own their life, that this miraculously is, is the only country in history that will actually in its best days protect it, protect your right to, to live your life. Um, so it does seem like well, let me ask you this. I'm gonna start this. Um, you know, Ayn Rand famously wrote a book called Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. I'd recommend that highly, but would you also say, Greg, that Americanism is an unknown ideal, even to Americans today? Yeah, and they're, the, in a way, the same idea. Um, America is the country of capitalism. It's the country of money, also, as she has uh, one of the characters in, in, in At Le Trunk say, and those are the things. Uh, it's the country of freedom, the first country explicitly founded on freedom, and the country that, in its basic structure of its laws, and in its best periods was the most capitalist. And that was the inspiration for the rest of the world to take on capitalism. And um, I would say to get Americanism, I think you have to, to, it's capitalism, but it's also focusing on something that I think is inherent in capitalism, that is required for real capitalism, but isn't as foregrounded in the term capitalism, which is um, the system of government that uh, makes uh, makes freedom possible, the kind of system of checks and balances, the, the having elections, but the elections don't 
run everything. And well, here, man, I'm going to drive. I'll, I'll and, you know. Let me jump in again. You know, so because, you know, to be here, Greg, Greg is excited for, excited for a lot of ways. But Greg's essay, and I think you're alluding to this a little bit, Greg's essay, you know, talks specifically about the value of voting. You know, most people, if you voting in a democracy, but voting in America, most people, you say, hey, what's great about America? They might say, here you get to vote. You get to vote here. And that's, but that's not, I don't want to say all it's cracked up to be, but if you would talk a bit about what is voting when it comes to Americanism and why is it is or is not important and what does it mean in yeah, our society? There are two, I think, mistaken views that you find. You find um, the more common view that I think is wrong and the view that, so Rand had a couple of questions on what is democracy and what is voting in American democracy. And I didn't answer those quite in those terms, but I wrote a an essay on the role of voting in the, the American system. And I think what you would have stressed writing in it on in the 40s, which I do you know, discuss is part of what I'm saying is um, this wrong idea that voting is everything, that you're free if you're able to vote, that a country where things are decided by votes is a democracy and a democracy is good. And what's good about it is that the majority is empowered. And I think that that's wrong. Majorities being empowered to do whatever they want is a form of tyranny. Um, as bad as any other form of tyranny, and it's, you know, the uh, um, one group lording it over another and, and imposing their will on, on the other. So there's a kind of fetishizing of voting, as though voting is the kind of essence of the American system of government, as though it's the essence of freedom or free government. And you can see uh, this was a big deal in the 20th century, and it was associated with the rise of, of communism. All of the communist countries referred to themselves as democracies. And in some sense, were. I mean, they had voting. There might have only been one party, but you know, uh, they had ballot boxes and polls. Um, and even now, today, people say, well, we're not socialists, we're democratic socialists. Right. You know, that's uh, uh, O.C. Octavio, Octavio Cortez, whatever this Alexandria. Alexandra Cortez, I don't know. But this is the movement now that, you know, it's, it's not socialism, it's democratic socialism. So, you know, democracy and voting is, is, a bit, is kind of seen as well. Hey, you can't can't go wrong when it's voting. And there's been democratic, so the democratic socialists, even in the, the 50s and such, distinguished themselves from the communists who also claimed they were democratic, but the democratic socialists said, well, right. But um, they all say, hey, but they the, vote, the fact that we are voting in. Yeah, we're voting, right. Um, but that's not so Americanism. That's, right, and it's not true that um, uh, anything the majority votes for is good. And, you know, the people, some of these people would not say that that's their view, but it amounts to their view if the majority wants it, it's good and it's okay. Uh, so that's one view that I think is wrong. The majority is wanting something doesn't make it right, it doesn't empower them morally to um, have their way with minorities, uh, any kind of minority, whether it's a racial minority, a religious minority, a financial minority, the very rich or the very poor or the people in a certain profession or whatever it might be. And that isn't the American system. No, right? It is no. not the American system that Hey, the majority rules. Right. That is an Americanism. And then on the other hand, now you're getting people, um, some people in the libertarian movement and elsewhere, who have, who are onto this problem, and who are very critical of democracy. And their view tends to be voting doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Voting rights don't matter. There shouldn't be people. Maybe there shouldn't even be a government. Or if there should, it doesn't matter whether voting is a part of it. And you you see books like this sometimes. Um, I don't know that I want to list any of them, but this is a, a view that's out there more these days, at least in certain circles. And I think both of these are, are real mistakes. Voting does play a really important role in a just system of government, but it's not the voting uh, that makes the system just. Rather, it's part of, uh, that is, it's not the fact that people voted for a system that makes it just or good. It's uh, uh, people have to vote for what's just. And they have to vote for, that is morally, they have to vote for the right type of government. So whoever rules a country, whether it's the people in the majority or whether it's the king or whoever it is, put aside the issue of who the right person to rule is. Right? Whoever is in charge, whoever makes the decisions, they can decide to have slaves or not have slaves. Having slaves is wrong, and not right. having slaves is wrong. And the good. fact that the guy was voted in. Right, doesn't make it any better. And or for just everyone who votes for the slave, right? They could decide to have a system of trials where the trials work by means of evidence and people are proven innocent until proven guilty, and that's the right way. Or they could decide to railroad and ostracize people and just vote them out of, off the island like a 
He's an F, we should ask him to that episode of Survivor, right? And that would be wrong. So certain ways for government to comport itself are right, and certain ones are wrong, independent of voting. Uh, and if we have voting in, the, in that system, it's the responsibility of the voters to vote for the right thing and not the wrong thing. Now, part of the right system of government, the right way to have a government, is to have voting in it playing a certain role. Because, and the, the role that voting plays is, is equalizing the political power among the people so that there are decisions to make, there are right ones and wrong ones. But then there's also the question of who it is that's going to make the decision that ought to make the right one but could make the wrong one. And if you and I have a different view, how are we going to uh, settle it? And there what voting says is, well, on those issues, we, uh, we go with the majority, but we go with the majority not just they get whatever they want when they want it, but they have certain occasions to vote on particular measures, and we set up systems of checks and balances. The, the, the framers, uh, Madison in particular, was really brilliant on, uh, on devising a system where voting plays a role. It plays a really crucial role, but it's not people can vote every time they want on whatever they want, and that makes it right or good. Uh, I, I'm going to ask for your questions. We're Republic. Uh, I'm going to welcome, uh, come join us. I don't know if Karen's going to want to be on TV. No, I'm kidding. Please, I'm saying, I'm not going to be on TV. I'm actually going to just push us. You can catch us there. So we're at Jonathan's really lovely apartment in Chicago with a gorgeous uh, view of the city, and my wife's just joined yeah, us. Yeah, no, and that's why this is actually such a great treat that we're, we're here. We haven't we've done this before. Um, I haven't done it at all, but you know, Greg happened to, to be in town and, and have a, a few moments, so we're, we're kind of hanging out. I wanted to, to go live and take questions from, any questions from all of you, so I'm looking on. So someone's saying we're a republic, is that not, not a... Yeah, well, let's, let's quickly open it up if there are any off, off cuff or any questions on Periscope or any comments. Any of you who've bought the book or read the book, it's available at, Capital, at uh, techbookofamericanism.com. How would you pitch this book to people who are interested in politics, but not interested in the deeper intellectual idea that gives rise to politics? It's a really good question. You know, I mean, people who say, I want to know what you think of, I don't want to put words in this person's mouth, but what do you think of what's going on in politics today? I mean, I'll, I'll give my perspective, uh, and then Greg, if you give, I mean, my, my perspective is, is that today's politics is boring. I'm frustrated with today's politics. It's to me, it's boring because it's just a question of. It's like the old um, the uh, to, to me, today's politics is like that cartoon of the wolves, and they say it's democracy is two wolves deciding. You know that H. L. Mencken, right? Uh, that quote: uh, "Democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on uh, what they're going to have for dinner." Two wolves and a lamb voting. On. It's, you know, it's it's we're all there's just. They're all collectivists now. So when you're saying, well, do I, am I on the right or on the left? To me, when I look at today's politics, current politics, it's just a question of, well, are you with this, this gang or that gang? And the right is saying, well, my gang can do it better. And the left is saying, well, my gang can do it better. And this book is a rejection of all that because this book says America is not about gangs. There are no gangs in America. This isn't a country where you have to be a part of a gang. You have to join up to a gang. You can be your own individual. And your rights are always going to be protected in America. So that's what's so revolutionary about this book. And that's why everyone should read it, especially someone who's passionate about today's politics, because they should be passionate, most likely in a way that they're different than they are today. I mean, what way is the person passionate about politics? Are you talking about someone who's idealistic, even if they're not philosophical, and they're interested in politics because they want to make the country better? Whatever their view of better is, freer or, or great again, yeah. or whatever view they have of what they think would make the country better, they care about it being good and that's what they want. Or are they interested in politics because they're like, uh, in the way you might be interested in sports, and it's fine to be interested in sports this way, but where you have one team and you're rooting for them, and who, uh, how many, you know, what, what's the latest thing on 538 about who might well, win this? Season, well, he actually, right? this person has a question, well, what about tariffs, as a, an example, he threw that out there, and uh, I mean, Harry Binswanger has an amazing essay in here. There's a lot of questions about, about, uh, about uh, there's a lot of answers about capitalism, but Harry's essay specifically about bi why buy American is un-American and why free trade is the only American system, is the true American system. 
And um, so the tariffs are addressed specifically in the book and you know, issues that are, we're all talking about and facing every day. Yeah, someone asked a, a moment ago um, what Americanism is or could we define it? And I would say, um, yeah, here's how, how I would think about that question before I give the definition. Because whenever you give a definition of something, you want to think, how do I know the definition I'm giving is the definition of the thing I started out defining? I can give you a slogan and say, here's what I mean by Americanism. But why should we mean by that? Why should that thing be the thing we mean by Americanism? So I would say, just by the nature of the word, Americanism, we're looking for, ism means an idea or a system, right? Um, and it's the American system, the American idea of how government should be. So what would it be to be the American idea of how government should be? It would be a way of governing or of looking at government, right, that's distinctive to America. It doesn't have to mean that only America has this at all, but there's this sense, and I think it's true, that there was something new in the American system of government. Maybe the American system of government didn't perfectly embody it. There was something new about it that then caught on, and other parts of the world took it up. And we are trying to recognize what it is that's new and important about it ourselves and live up to it. And other countries have then, have then taken it on from us. And so if you think there's something like that, there's something new and good, maybe you think it's bad, but new and different about the American way of, of, of having a country, then whatever that thing is, is American. Well, and, and right and there, that is, actually, that's uh -huh. actually even revolutionary because, you know, many out there, I don't want to say the president specifically, but the president would say, you know, a country is defined by its borders. Uh -huh. you know, this country is specifically the, the land, the geographic land. Other people would say, well, this country is, you know, our country is based on the color, the color of your skin. If you're this color, well, your language right. you speak. The language you speak. So, but, you know, um, you know, Americanism, as we're defining it, I believe, as Ayn Rand understood it and presents it, isn't about that. It isn't about geography. It is about ideas. Yeah, and it's a particular <laughs> way of having a, a, a country. Uh, it's, it's, and what it is, essentially, is uh, individualism and capitalism. So capitalism as a social system and individualism as the um, way of viewing the relationship of people to one another and to their society that underrides uh, um, and is realized in that political system. And so America is the country of individualism. That's Rand's message in the textbook. And then it's, you know, that's spelled out a lot more in the individual essays. And I think it, it, it's a really important point and has been something that I think a lot of Americans have recognized in the past, that America is a country of ideas, that what it is to be American is to uh, embrace those ideas and that system and that, and that way of living, rather than uh, having a certain skin color or being born in a certain place. Of course, there are, there are always people who've had that more um, uh, perceptual level, you know, he's one of us, because uh, yeah. he comes from a right. view of, view of uh, America, but that's, that's something that's in common to every country. That's what thoughtless people think about what it is to be one of them wherever That's what collectivists from. think, yeah, actually. That's what right, like, hey, he's one of us, they, he has this, this color skin, well, they're one of us. But America's been better than that, and the American popular culture has been better than that. There's the idea that there's something special about America, and this is the real essence of the idea of American exceptionalism. That we are, yeah, everybody could say, well, you're French because you speak French, or you're a Spaniard because you lisp a bit when you say your uh, S's or THs in Spanish and a Mexican doesn't, or you're, or you're from this side of this river or line. Uh, every place has that, and in that sense, every country is the same. But America is exceptional because there's something America's about, and that thing that America's about is what made us great and what made us a power in the world, which made us rich, which made us, what made us a destination that everybody wants to go to, what made us so influential in the world. And if you don't think that, you are not an American exceptionalist. Uh, and I think American exceptionalism is important. There's something really right about, there's something different, historically significant about this country. And I think we're really losing that, particularly in the people who view themselves as patriotic today. Not all of them, but a lot of them, we have a movement that bills itself as patriotic, America first, make America great again. And it's totally devoid of ideas, mm -hmm. and it's totally devoid of any moral self, of any self-esteem for America. And what self-esteem is for yourself is you have a standard of what's good. And you say, boy, I'm good, I live up to this standard. Not you say, you know, uh, it's me, right or wrong. 
but it's me, I'm good because I'm right. And to have national self-esteem, which I think is a big part of America's DNA, but something we're really losing, is to say America's good because it's right. It's got principles that's based on their good principles. And we've had from the political left for decades and decades, real attacks on America. America's not that yes, good. Yes. It's not that special. And now what we have from the, the, the right, right is saying, America's not special, but we're for it because my country right or wrong. Yes. Let's make America great again, not by making it good again, not by recognizing what's good about it, still good and had been good all along and recommitting ourselves to it, but just by saying we're going to assert our will. We've got bigger guns. Uh, we, we have the UN in New York. We can throw them out. We should throw them out of New York, by the way, but that's another issue. We can put tariffs here and there. Not an unprincipled um, uh, treating the country like um, someone who knows they're rotten deep down but uh, wants to be aggressive and fighting about it because they're not comfortable with that fact. They think they ought to be good, but they're not. no, they're not, and so they're, they're touching. And I think a lot of what we're seeing on the right is that it's the, today. It's the symptom of the left having succeeded in undermining our confidence in America. And if we want to win that confidence back, if we want to be Americans, if we want this country to be what it could, and if we want to be real patriots, we have to think about what is it that made the country great? What is it that's worth loving about this country? And then we need to recommit ourselves to that. And this is a good, great book to start if you want to think about that. And so for the person who's interested in politics and who's bothered by the left with its running down of America as it's been doing for decades, but who senses that there might be something wrong with the response we're getting to that from the right, if you're interested in politics but not interested in ideas, you got to get interested in deeper ideas to answer that. And here's, again, a way to start that's, I think, really accessible. It's not a deep dive into really technical issues. It starts to appreciate very right, accessible. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, actually, Greg, Greg I, I have to say, I mean, I, Greg is, is a scholar, is a philosopher. Everyone always says, I'm not a philosopher. I'm lucky to be sitting here with one who actually is a philosopher and an expert philosopher. Greg is the author of numerous books, has a new one, I think, in the hopper. It's coming out in March. I know it's on my Google, uh, my Amazon pre Pre-sale, but I'm an editor of the books and author of some of the chapters. An editor, right? Uh, uh, but uh, but a philosopher. This is one of Greg's books. They're they're dense, thankfully, because Greg does the scholarship that allows uh, us non-scholars to bring you very accessible books and books that are great primers and introductions to some of these ideas. Well, I want let's take try to. Uh, take some. Uh, what, what kind of? I see these questions flying by. I know. I mean, I, I can't I, read I, them from here. I know. We have. Uh, we'll, we'll get a little, a little this closer. Is your setup. You know how to work with <laughs> Well, we'll take. If there's any questions, um, you know, off off the cuff, uh, you know, I know, I don't want to wait too. Scroll up. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. Here. Isolationism isn't practical. We'll never put the global business culture back in the bottle. Well, it's not practical, but it's also not American. Isolation is what they mean by not trading, not traveling, not, not uh, well, isolationism is, is what Ayn Rand called, or at least she thought of it as what she called a package deal, where you put ideas together that don't belong together. And the, the kind of, you know, the theory of this America first line uh, from Trump now, and that was a line that was used by um, Lindbergh and a lot of others in the, in the 40s who didn't want us to get involved in World War II and who were opposed to foreign entanglements, and that, that position is widely seen as discredited because, you know, the Nazis were really awful. But um, Rand's own view was that we shouldn't have gotten involved in World War II, at least until we did, and, and she was skeptical of the way we did and so forth, and certainly not in World War I. So, so one side of isolationism of the package is we shouldn't get involved in wars in other places. We should only get involved in wars when we have a, a national interest there. We shouldn't get in alliances that bind us to get involved in wars when we wouldn't otherwise have to and so forth. And I think there's something right about that position, that that is something we should avoid. And we're in a lot of wars that we don't need to be. We have been in the past in wars we haven't needed to be in. Um, and so if what you mean by isolationism is that, then, uh, then okay. But if what you mean by it is um, that we shouldn't be involved in and engaged in trade in the rest of the world, that we shouldn't think that what happens in the rest of the world matters to our life, that we shouldn't be using our foreign policy in ways other than getting into war with people to encourage freedom and press freedom around the globe. Uh, or to denounce and tyranny. To denounce tyranny, yeah. yeah. Uh, that we shouldn't be doing those things and we could be indifferent to what happens in the world, then, of course, that, that position, I think, is wrong. And the, the this, 
isolationism, at least Ramtha, is a smear term that, that uh, in effect, creates the idea that if you don't want to get into wars all over the place, and you don't want to join all kinds of treaty organizations, you must think it doesn't matter what happens in the rest of the world, and you just want to hunker down in your country. And I think, um, I think those two things have to be pulled apart. I'm a globalist in the sense of wanting a global capitalism, wanting to engage with other countries in trade, wanting to knock down trade barriers, and also politically wanting personally and wanting the country to promote freedom abroad, but not by getting involved in foreign entanglements and wars, except in those situations where, where there's a real national interest. Or, or wanting to have a national, or a world government. Yeah, or wanting to have a government. Which Rand actually specifically talks about in the book. And one of my, my favorite, oh, there's, there's so many favorite parts in, in, in this. I mean, she talks specifically about why you don't want to have, she's, she's not in favor of a world government, which is something that, you know, I mean, there's so many questions, and I don't want to take up all of Greg's evening and, and like that, but um, uh, but I want to try to, can I, do you mind if can I read this to you, kind of yeah. rapid fire? Let's try to keep these really like, this is like a challenge, can like, give me like short riffs on this, so we can just try See to get I through them. Yeah, like, like 10 words tops. Remember like, don't name that tune? Can you do it in 10 words? I don't know if I can do it in 10 words. All right, well, I mean, let's. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't just but I'm, I'm, uh, I don't want to. I want. I could keep you here, and I know the audience could keep you here all night. But oh, um, oh, please turn off your location phone inside Periscope. Probably as smart. Uh, uh, I have all the anti-Americans come into your apartment. Um, let's see. Antifa's on its way now. How should individualism individualism impact foreign policies and relationships? Funny you should ask that because well, Jordan's got a got a, a nice piece on that here. Yeah, Alain Giorno, who also has his own book I have in the other room, talking at great lengths, you know, his, his piece in here is specifically about what would American foreign policy do. So there's your, there's your quick answer to that. Um, Leslie says, we're a republic. We're not a democracy. Yeah, the, the problem with the quick answer to we're not a democracy, we're a republic is all of these words have fluid and loose definitions. So, right, you're um, globalist. Yeah, and all of these, you know, communist countries call themselves republics. So, the, the term republic is vague and elastic enough that um, you can say we're a republic, but someone will twist the meaning or understand well, and, the meaning of that too. I mean, there's Plato's Republic, which is right. a dictatorship going way back. Well, would you? Would you? Would you? Would would it be? Would you? Would you be comfortable saying that? the notion of the idea of the concept of individual rights is really unique to Rand. Um, no, that idea is in John Locke, and it's in America's founders. Um, I think Rand has new things to say about it, and I think she has a deeper perspective on it. I'd say America is a, is a um, constitutional republic. I think it's probably the best way to describe the country if you need a term like that, but we don't have a, a great term or an individualist republic. Oh, wait, we have Americanism. Yeah. We have Americanism, which is the, the term in the book as well. Um, both sides of the same politicians are interested in power, period, Leslie says. Uh, uh, I guess that's true, but I don't think the problem is the politicians. Yes, like there are these people special always say term people. limits. There are these special people. We get the politicians we deserve. Yeah. We right. had Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump as the two people running. Yes. Um, we, we there are need, lots of better people in the country. We need college kids to read this so that they become the politicians four and five and six years from now. And that they become the voters. If people in the, yes, in the yes, Democratic yes, Party the didn't want someone like Hillary Clinton, and you, you, the ones who didn't wanted Bernie Sanders, who's no better, he probably were, right? So if people didn't want someone like Hillary Clinton, she wouldn't have become the Democratic nominee. And if people didn't want someone like Trump, he wouldn't have become the Republican nominee. Mean, these are the people that when we kind of sum up all of our preferences as a nation and see what they average out to. We get Trump and Clinton. And if we want better than that, we've got to get better ourselves and get our friends and neighbors better. It's not a matter of, you know, getting rid of a couple of people. Yes, who are exactly. It's not like if we had a better, you can't get a better president. I mean, Rand makes this point. I, I think she says it in the book, but I know she says it where she says that elections are, yes, yeah, she does say it say in the book. I mean, this book is full of gold. Bruce Van Horn said this. Uh, one of her great nuggets is she says that elections are won every month of the year except for November. Just brilliant. Just a song. I mean, she, that's like a tweet. Perfect tweet before there was even Twitter ran. She it. could do it in the 10 words. Yeah, she could do it but because making the point that, you know, uh, you know elections are not won and, and, uh, in November. They're won every other month of the year when people are thinking about these ideas 
talking about them, debating them, understanding them. Uh, all right, let's try to uh, get through a few more of these. Um, is there a way to change the minds of the young with the progressive agenda everywhere today? Well, you, you get them while they're young, and I think you get them with a book like this, which introduces individualism, which is the exact opposite of progress progressivism, uh, in a very easy and understandable way. You know, Atlas is a very thick book. I understand that. Uh, it was difficult for me to get through it as a college kid. This book is barely 100 pages. And it's divided into essays, which makes it a great read for young people specifically. Yeah, I don't think, you know, every generation thinks, um, oh, the kids these days, they've been ruined by progressivism. It's not like in my day when people could think for themselves more. That is mostly BS because it was true for three or four generations ago. But oh, the people I actually, saying I don't it, know. the people saying it now are the people who were ruined by the. the, the you know what, Greg? I gotta say, you now. know what? I remember they used to make. There was a remember, uh, not Family Guy. What's the one that was King of the Hill? Remember uh -huh. King of the Hill? Yeah. And they used to have a, a thing where they said Bobby and Thanksgiving. They taught Thanksgiving, uh -huh. which was a very. They taught it like at a very bad. That's actually what they're teaching kids. Now. Yeah, it's awful. But they, the real poison is what was was already there forty years ago. Right. Uh, already there. It's it's not that the kids are so much worse than their parents or their grandparents. This is a book that's complaining about the decline in the country because people don't understand what Americanism is in the forties. That's you know yeah, our that's grandparents. True. And yeah. the essential problem is not some difference between some 18-year-old social justice warrior and his grandfather who fought in World War II. The essential problem was there with the great generation that fought in World War II, that socialized medicine in the country, that is, yes. uh, in, 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 uh, yeah. that socialized... That prompted her to write the book. That prompted her to write the book. And the, yeah, there were respects in which the 20-year-olds today are worse than that. Um, and there are some respects in which they're a little better than that. But the essential problem is not recent. It goes back to the early 20th century, and it goes back way further than that. In fact, it goes back to Plato and Jesus and Kant. This person asks, um, "It's is it wrong to label everything that is not individualism as socialism? It's not black or white." Um, I don't. So I think socialism is a particular form of the opposite of individualism. I say the opposite what of about collectivism. Yes, and I think yeah, it is black and white in yeah. essence. There are shades of gray, but the shades of gray are mixtures. Yeah, and she, and that's why. What makes I think that it is, it is black and white. I mean, Rand is all about black and white. There is good and evil in the world, and there's two basic premises of the world today: collectivism and individualism. This country is what makes it. I think this is my own editorialism there, editorializing. What makes it exceptional is that it's individualist, and that's what uh, is talked about at great lengths in the book. Um, Greg, you're getting just a lot of thanks from everywhere, everywhere. Everyone's thanking you. Uh, for your insight, and I'm thanking you for your contributions, especially. Um, individualist Periscope from a collective nationalist view. I couldn't take it that way. Uh, how do we slow the progressive agenda? We talked about that in the book, it's a great idea. Why the hate towards Hillary Clinton so strong? Some even compare her to Stalin. Why do people hate the, let me ask, why do people are so down on the left in terms of a punching bag, but don't give the same criticism to what they see collectivism on the right. I mean, I voted for Hillary Clinton. I did it grudgingly. I don't like her. I think she'd be an awful president. I think she'd just be somewhat less awful than our current one. And I think you were on, I think Fox News hates you now because you uh, <laughs> should be less better than Trump. So, yeah, you, I, I mean, well, you've got two guys here who, who I think neither of us are fans. But I also of spent Clinton. nine years hating Hillary, and I still hate Hillary. Me too. So, we're not, um, the, the, so why do other people hate her so much? Well, I think the, one, she's bad, but I think what happened, so think about just the history with Hillary Clinton. She's uh, Bill Clinton's wife. Bill Clinton gets elected in the 90s, right? Um, she's still around. This started yeah. when I was in high school. Me too, yeah. And I, well, young, I'm a little younger than you, but I was in middle school. And part of it might be sexism and stuff, that, that's what she and the left would claim. But a big part of it is Hillary Clinton tried to socialize medicine the rest of the way in America back in the 90s. Yes, and that she was started with that takes a village. And she, it takes a village. She was awful, and a lot of people reacted against that then for good reason. Oh, and then the whole medical profession was against the socializing of medicine that she wanted to do, and a lot of people were, and it was defeated. And we got the Republicans in Congress, and then, but everyone also knew the American healthcare system wasn't working well in the nineties, right, early nineties. That's why there was some traction for the. 
And so from Hillary Clinton's Hillary Care being defeated till 2008, what did the rest of the country, what did the anti-socialists, what did the allegedly individualists, what did the right come up with as a replacement? Obamacare is what the right mm -hmm. came up with. Mm -hmm. They passed it in Massachusetts. It came out of the Heritage Foundation and all kinds of these. There was, it wasn't let's uh, right. uh, it wasn't it under, under, under Romney right. in Massachusetts. It wasn't real free market reforms. So, and the right never talked about it. The Republicans never talked about right. it. And, and they're still not talking about it because Trump is saying he wants everyone to be covered anyway. Exactly. So what happens is you have a sense that there's something socialist that doesn't fit with America about Hillary's agenda. You have people reacting against that, but you don't have them formulating contrary ideas for something better and right and consistent with America. And so when you have that kind of a dynamic, what you get is that the party opposed to uh, her or opposed to these socialist men makes bogeymen of the people. And so in place of responses to what Hillary Clinton was about, which is bad, you got Hillary's awful, yes. she's killing people secretly and somehow managing to cover it up for all this time, and Obama's from Kenya and that's what's wrong with him, and all this kind of anti-ideological, uh, yes, conspiracy theoretic, as though, and it's the same thing that happened with the, the response to the communists in the 40s, as though the problem wasn't the ideas, and we need better ideas, but this cabal of awful people. And so when you have a sense that there's something wrong in the world, but you don't know what it is, and you don't have the courage to look for it and to challenge the ideas that are giving rise to it, what you end up doing is uh, treating it as though it's some particular person who's a bogeyman or a monster. And then we just get, get rid of Hillary. Oh, yeah, that Hillary. And that's what happened. And she's awful. She's really bad. But we're getting people who are just as bad or worse because we're not And, and that's, why, and that's why I have to say, I think I stand by my Hillary endorsement Look, it's not about Hillary, but I stay my my Hillary endorsement because you know what? The Republicans are spending all their time hating on Hillary now, and she's not even in office. Yeah. Wouldn't you rather have be hating on her and have her be in office and be hopefully working on presenting some of the right ideas, thinking about some of the right and ideas, she integrating would have been some of the right ideas? In this book? by the Republicans if she were the president, she wouldn't have gotten anything passed. Whereas, um, she, you know, uh, it, but if, if McCain had won in two thousand eight. Uh, we would have gotten the same bill as Obamacare with no opposition. Now we got it with opposition, but of course now it's, there's no more opposition. They're just pretending to have it. And in fact, um, people will hate me for this, but um, more, Hillary, more than they are hate more than they already hate both of us. Hillary was less anti-capitalist than Trump. Um, they're both pretty anti-capitalist, but Hillary was less. I think would be doing less regulating of the financial sector than Trump is doing now. Less tariffs. All of these are anti-capitalist left-wing measures. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there's, 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 uh, the, you, there's no one who is a voice for what I think is Americanism anymore. Capitalism, laissez-faire at all, and certainly is discussed in the book in great detail, uh, which is why you want to pick it up. Um, but Jonathan, it, it's that, like that courage to look at ideas that's really what's needed. And to think about, well, what, if America's been drifting more and more towards socialism or collectivism, more and more of the economy being taken over by the government. Why is it? Why has it been doing it for decades? And it's, the problem isn't some conspiracy from another country, whether it's the Soviet Russia or now Putin with his, you know, uh, internet trolls. It's not Hillary Clinton and her cabal of child molesters or whatever people think it has. It's not some one villainous guy with his mustache that he's twirling. It's ideas that are in and there's no shortcut. Accepting. And there's no shortcut to finding and challenging those ideas and to learning what's true and then thinking about how to convince people that what we need is freedom and what freedom is. And again, the book is a great thank place you, to start. Thank you for again. Yeah, and and uh, uh, we, we don't want to go on until there's one more question I want to take in, in any last call, but you know, I, I want to thank Greg not only for, for contributing and for you know his perspective from the get go and being part of the project uh, and, and thank him for sitting with us today. and. And uh, I'll ask you this final question, and actually quickly encourage everyone to check out the book at textbookofamericanism.com. It's 18 or $19 delivered, including shipping to, I mean, it's just like a, and for new Ayn Rand, it's pretty, re, pretty revolutionary. This is a great stocking stuff for, for anyone who's interested in politics on any level, and I think specifically for young people, really as young as high school, who may be just, just getting into politics or thinking about maybe they're in their school political club or they're, you know, volunteering. This is a great stocking stuffer. Steve asks, does individual freedom, this isn't loaded at all, 
require open immigration of Muslims into Europe, the US and Israel, as some objectivists believe? Does individual re freedom re uh, require open immigration? I don't really know what open immigration means. And I think what the right immigration policy for a country should be is uh, actually a fairly difficult question that you have to know a lot about what's going on in the world and in the neighbors of that country to, uh, to know the answer to. But there is no immigration problem, no serious immigration problem in America now. And all of the people who are concerned, and I think in general, the right immigration policy is the way to figure out how to get as many immigrants as possible in a way that's safe for the country and that doesn't uh, create such demographic change so quickly that the political system becomes unstable. So the problem is how to make it possible and easy for people to immigrate there in a way where they naturalize slowly and over time or over generations rather than quickly. So that's what I think is a matter of political philosophy. As a matter of what's going on now in the country, there's not an immigration problem. There hasn't been one. And immigration, people, I think, illegal, quote unquote, yeah. immigration is that it, it's something like a 10-year low. And all the people who are concerned about it now, I encourage you to think about when you got concerned about it and why. Because I think what we have now is not a, a rational concern about it based on actual problems that are happening, but a hysteria that has been ginned up. And it's the, the, it's the kind of hysteria that's of a par with the kind of thinking Hillary Clinton is a child molester or Trump is an agent of a foreign government or something else where the, um, it's a paranoia created by not wanting to think about the ideas that made this possible. And uh, we want to find someone to blame for it. We want to find, a, 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 and I think then immigrants uh, and, and allegedly open and, and out of control immigration is to blame, but we don't have a lot of immigrants coming. Even this caravan that they all came in, it would be a tiny amount, it wouldn't accomplish anything bad. And the kind of ideas, the Democrats, if they get a little bit more, they'll turn all these states blue. What would happen if, if, if it's not like the Democratic Party has some coherent agenda that they're trying to push. Uh, if, if it became the case that 20% uh, of Republicans just dropped dead tomorrow, so that it was impossible for the Republicans to win any national level elections, or conversely, if the same thing happened with the Democrats, and 20% of the Democrats want drop dead, and, and the, the demographic change that the, the Democrats could never win any election, it's not that the party that survived would get all their agenda passed, right? Because the parties don't agree on what they want. What would happen is the issues that are now randomly distributed, so that there's a, an ad hoc, historically contingent coalition on the left and on the right would all switch. In 10 years, we'd get two totally different parties they might be still called Republican and Democrat, but they'd be for something different. It's not like the Democrats want us to be socialists and the Republicans want us to be capitalist or fascist, and whoever wins will get their way. Um, none of those things are true. It it's all comes from not thinking about what drives a country. And what drives a country aren't cabals or party leaders, it's the ideas. And it's not how many immigrants came here. And that starts with the book. So thank you all. We, we're going to go have dinner. Yeah, actually. So. We're, well, there might be some illegal immigrants in the kitchen uh, washing up and making the food. Oh, let me get the like, ice. Are you listening? Let's uh, meet us at the corner of and arrest these people immediately. No, uh, thank you for joining us. I hope we can do it again. We didn't probably knock on your door. Thank you for making yourself available to yeah, the audience today. Let me know if you're in the New York area. I will. I will. I absolutely will. We'll be in hopefully your neighborhood to to uh, to uh, promote the book and talk about the book. So thank you so much for being with us and uh, for both on Periscope and as well on YouTube as well. Um, lots of questions there, so we'll, we'll cut it there and see you next time. Have a good one.